Ningekuwa taxi driver Ningekupa lifti kila mara Ningekuwa shamba boy Hello everyone, Dr. Shabazz here, and I'm going to be doing an overview of Chapter 4. Uh, this chapter is Social and Cultural Environments, and we did miss Thursday. We had our Black History Town Hall meeting. Uh, they called it, it was in a town hall format, and they called it a town hall discussion. But generally, it is... Um, this time that we have our convocation and the class was uh, canceled for Thursday. So what I'd like to do is do a video for chapter four so that we can uh, regain some of that time that that we lost. OK, so let's talk about this chapter, chapter four, social and cultural environments. And we have dealt with this uh, issue quite a bit. And we also studied a theoretical framework with Theodore Levitt and his idea of globalization. And there are lots of activities. When you talk about globalization, there are all kinds of cases. And some of these cases are very uh, contemporary. They're easy to understand. And they involve a number of companies that we're familiar with. Now, we may know that Best Frozen Foods is a fictitious case, but there are lots of other companies that have made uh, this, this idea of globalization one of their prime uh, areas of focus. And again, on the exam, many of you talked about this idea of globalization, but there are two different ways to approach it. You can globalize, but there's the idea of standardization versus adaptation. So which way will you globalize is the main question. I just want to show you what McDonald's has done. And in fact, um, I'm not sure if I showed this to you in class, but I just want to give you an idea of this website here. This is McDonald's India, and this gives you an idea of some of the ways that they have adapted McDonald's to suit uh, their demographic and to suit their specific taste. As you can see, it looks like a regular McDonald's. They have some very interesting promotions here with Spider-Man. Uh, and you probably didn't know Spider-Man was in India, but um, these type of action figures have gone global. But let me just give you uh, a look at the uh, at their menu, they have some very interesting menu selections. And as you can see here, some of these you will not find here in the US. You have spicy McChicken, chicken wrap, McSpicy paneer, which is a uh, cheese, big spicy paneer wrap, some of the others, McAlu, which is a potato patty, McPuff, cake float. And here you have a green chili alu naan, you know, which is interesting. The naan bread is something that is commonly eaten with Indian cuisine. The alu wrap, you have also the nutritional uh, details here uh, with these uh, particular sandwiches. Salsa bean burger, salsa chicken burger, and they have some of the bowl items as well. So they have quite a bit of variety here in the uh, Indian menu. And here are some of the, uh, I guess you would say, um, uh, more, more standard options with the McChicken meal and some of the um, McNugget product, products and then your breakfast items. So that's, that's one of those uh, cases of uh, adaptation. And you can see that McDonald's has put a lot of effort into this idea of catering to that specific market, which has 
very uh, specific needs being that their, their um, McDonald's offerings will not include hamburgers, you know, which you have to be very creative if that's not going to be what you focus on as a hamburger company. So let's uh, move on to the content of chapter four. We've already gone through this idea of culture and the elements of culture and what it is. We know that there is culture that basically shapes society. This is based on tradition and history and anthropology and all these other things that make a culture what it is. And it evolves over a long period of time. And I believe we all understand that. Geert Hofstede, who is the the one who created the, the idea of the Hofstede's framework, which has six different elements. I believe the book gives you five, but there are six different elements that go along with his model. Uh, and he defines culture as being the collective programming of the mind that distinguishes the members of one category of people from those of another. And so you have subcultures, uh, cultures, the general culture, and then you have subcultures which have their own unique kind of uh, identity. And they, they're based on a number of um, demographics. I mean, they can be ethnicity. Uh, they can fall under the different um, uh, economic groups. Uh, they also can be uh, class. Uh, some societies are very class oriented. These are the elements of culture. Uh, and if you look at your textbook, chapter four begins on page 106. This particular diagram um, that I have on the screen, unfortunately, is not in this book but I think it what it provides you with uh, an idea of how complex culture can be and all of these different elements uh, and these are things that I pointed out in class uh, when I showed this this diagram you have a number of different institutions that define our uh, the prevailing culture our family structure the way we're educated, our religious foundation, government, and of course our business sector, our commercial sector. You have different aspects of culture, the material and non-material culture, and you get into the idea of aesthetics. On the previous slide it had a bubble with aesthetics, and the idea of aesthetics is how do we perceive uh, appearance, beauty, and much, much of it, it goes with, uh, obviously, some um, expectation of norms. Uh, it, it deals with tradition. It deals may, may deal with uh, religious aspects in terms of what you wear and the things that you display uh, in terms of your uh, everyday, uh, everyday uh, living. So some of these uh, involved, besides clothing, you have decorative art. They have tools here in terms of what it is that uh, you're able to to use on a daily basis. Um, decorative art, body adornment, homes. Now, I've been to some countries and I've looked at the homes that people live in and they're very modest in comparison to what we have here, but they're very functional. Uh, you may look at it as being, you know, maybe not modern or maybe being primitive, but uh, very functional and essentially meets the needs of that um, that family or that individual that's uh, staying in the staying in that um, dwelling. Some of the homes I have uh, been are uh, were made out of cow dung. And you go inside and it's not as if you can smell the, the odor uh, because these cow dung has 
dried and has been fashioned into blocks and it has been used to build these these uh, structures and it's just very interesting that they have it's, it's a natural cooling system that they have with the the roof that they build on these houses which are made out of uh, branches and banana leaves and other types of organic materials and it's just a very interesting uh, architecture in the way these uh, structures are built Then you have abstract culture, which is um, obviously um, uh, when you talk about religion, that is a prescription for many of the things that uh, will determine how we act uh, and behave. I want to show you this article here. And this may surprise you, but here you have McDonald's, which we just looked at McDonald's India. But here in Israel, they have actually executed something that is very intriguing because in Israel, the Orthodox Jews have lobbied strong and hard enough to get McDonald's to distinguish between kosher restaurants and non-kosher restaurants. And that's not really the kicker. The kicker is McDonald's has decided that they're going to change the color. Now, we know McDonald's is the symbol with the golden arches and the red background, right? So it says here, the international chain's instantly recognizable yellow and red signs have been scrapped at two branches in Tel Aviv in favor of the McDonald's name in blue and white in Hebrew in the word kosher alongside. And I point that out because this is this is very interesting that a company would change their branding to suit this particular demographic of Orthodox Jews. But here is uh, a case uh, where religion plays a role in determining the uh, consumption pattern and the branding. I also remember an article in USA Today, it was similar. It was talking about the fact that those in Israel still want their cheeseburger. They still, still want the cheeseburger because they are more moderate Jews. Orthodox Jews do not mix meat and dairy. So that was the distinction. And so you had this article talking about this struggle within the uh, Israel Israeli society in terms of how they were going to deal with this question. How is global consumer culture shaped and how does it emerge? Uh, we may know and we may affirm by the Levitt article that technology plays a big role in the perceptions that we have uh, on a variety of cultural issues. Uh, and it is true that some cultures, uh, consumer cultures are uh, not only emerging in other markets, but it's, it's consolidating. You have a number of different trends that are being spread around the globe. And as I can refer you to some, uh, some of these other readings, that uh, I have uh, bookmarked here. Here is a story about how McDonald's conquered India. Now, in my global business class, I show a video on McDonald's in India. And because of the restriction of using beef, you know, which is prohibited, you have to have a different strategy. So this article talks about, and this article is about five years, almost five years old, but it talks about the process in which McDonald's uh, entered India and how they had to cater to that market, including you know, the idea of using the uh, Ronald McDonald mascot. In fact, in Japan, they had a case when McDonald's tried to promote Ronald McDonald and they found out that the clown was 
not really offensive, but it, it gave pause to Japanese consumers because when you cover yourself in white ash, it is a sign of death or a sign of mourning. So the Ronald McDonald clown was not the appropriate type of icon to have in that particular society. But of course, some in some cultures, that icon is uh, transferable. So here they talk about vegetarian family values and how that was a major consideration, obviously, as we saw the menu uh, from the website. But of course, you can see a cultural shift in terms of these types of fast foods that are being consumed. Uh, here's a case in Ghana, of all places, West Africa, where Kentucky Fried Chicken has made a foray into the, the country and uh, has really uh, uh, has really built a, a, a foothold in terms of selling this idea of tasty chicken. But they talk about the trend of obesity in Ghana as it relates to uh, KFC and the fact that some of the adaptations that took place in KFC had to do with how the food was prepared which included using palm oil as opposed to the um, the regular oil that's uh, used here. And some of, some of the uh, trends on consuming this uh, food has, uh, there has been a concern uh, because of the, the trend of uh, obesity. You also have Going back to India, Domino's reinventing itself in India by coming up with some adaptations. Here's the, the kitchen and you have some of the different concepts that are being laid out for Domino's uh, in India. And it makes for a very interesting cross-cultural case study. This was out of Fast Company some time ago. Another case, Taco Bell in China. Now obviously tacos are not ethnically Chinese. It's a very new type of experience for uh, for Chinese um, to have this Mexican cuisine. Uh, but it has um, taken a foothold into China and ha they have tried some different things as well, including reducing the uh, the oil content uh, in the Mexican food and so it's been a very interesting experience here as I'll just scroll through some of the uh, some of the pictures here so you have Japanese beer and alcoholic slushes are on the menu at Taco Bell in Shanghai which is very interesting The restaurant features a transparent kitchen where skeptical, skeptical cons customers can watch their food being assembled. So unlike most fast food places, your food is assembled uh, in the back. So this is a, a very, very different model. So it says here, Mexican food could take off in China, she says, because people are willing to try new things. Uh, and not to mention, it is a, a huge market when you talk about the 1.4 billion people. Here's another case uh, in Brazil dealing with Nestle's. Nestle's is the maker of uh, a lot of uh, consumer goods, snack foods. And here it talks about how they were able to penetrate the Brazilian market. And we're talking about in the outskirts of Brazil, in places where the distribution channels have not uh, been developed. And so they have this different way of delivering the uh, snacks to the people who are in the, the countryside. But they also talk about the uh, issue of obesity uh, as well. 
Here's another case, um, moving away from food, adapting Listerine to a global market. Uh, and in this case, they talk about some of the ways that they have to adapt the product. And I actually read this article many years ago. And this, this was the, the, the article that I got out of New York Times. And they talked about some of the different adaptations that they had to make. There is an alcohol-free Listerine Zero popular in Muslim countries where spirits are forbidden. Green tea Listerine made specifically for Asian markets. And most recently, Listerine Naturals, a mouthwash geared towards Americans' obsession with non-synthetic ingredients that was introduced this year in the U.S. and could expand overseas. So some very interesting adaptations to these um, uh, products. So getting back to aesthetics. Aesthetics is appearance, this whole concept of beauty, what colors mean. You have what's called the language of culture, where you have language in terms of time, space, negotiation, language of color, language of symbols, language of gifts, language of friendship. All of these things are different languages. So the language of color, and this is different, somewhat different from when we talk about the psychology of color, which you may have learned about in, in marketing, that these colors, colors uh, have different triggers. They give different types of feelings. When you see the color blue or you see the color red or you see the color green or white, they have a relationship to consumer behavior. This is slightly different because this is saying that these colors take on specific cultural meanings. Not just that they make you feel excited or they make you feel calm, but these associations, as you can see here, red associated with blood, winemaking, activity, heat, and vibrancy in some countries, but is poorly received in some African countries. And again, we don't particularly know why blood may be received negatively, but uh, it's culturally specific. Then you have the other colors, blue. Since the pigment is rare, ancient Egyptians, Chinese, Mayans associated it with royalty and divinity. Half of interviewees state blue is the favorite color. Okay. Doesn't give you a whole lot of detail there, but uh, certainly blue is uh, commonly used in a lot of marketing material. White identified with purity and cleansiness in the West with death in parts of Asia. Again, that whole idea of putting white on your face connoting death or a bad omen uh, was something that McDonald's saw firsthand when they tried to promote Ronald McDonald in, in Japan. Music, of course, is uh, universal, but a lot of forms of music um, have been um, transported to different places, and they are different, not only the music itself, but a number of different uh, strands of music and fusion. You have a lot of music that, that have taken on a different uh, characteristic, um, and different genres of music have... Uh, been changed to suit that local taste. Uh, not only local taste, but different instruments, different ways of singing, uh, and it's been very uh, evident in uh, a number of genres, including hip-hop. There are a number of um, artists uh, who have taken uh, hip-hop and they've created uh, you know, sub-genres of, of hip-hop, which is a very, very interesting uh, development. I think we've we've um, talked about a lot of the dietary uh, issues. Uh, here are a few more. This is a very important uh, part when you talk about language communication, uh, the study of signs in their meaning, both spoken and unspoken. A lot of times we, we do signs and we have a particular meaning that we're trying to convey, but sometimes these meaning 
uh, will change from society to society. And you'll find that there are uh, lots of um, taboos in terms of signs that you convey, the different gestures and how close you stand to someone, uh, whether you touch them or not, whether you are able to greet them in a certain way, uh, is uh, obviously uh, areas that are very, very important to understand. So here you have this idea of spoken or verbal language. And you have categories. Syntax means how a sentence is put together. And in some, in some languages, even the spelling may vary. Uh, you'll have different variations of the same word being used. For example, my first name has two A's. D-A-A-I-M and in some places it's D-A-I-M. Now the words are the same. They mean the same thing, obviously. It says here Ru Russia has a relatively free word order. Now we know English has a certain structure and you have to follow it otherwise people will get confused. Uh, but Russia has a relatively free order, word order. And even in some other Latin-based languages, you'll find out that you have adjectives that are actually behind the, the noun instead of in front of the noun as in English. So you have some differences in how uh, languages are translated. Semantics, what does it mean? Uh, phonology, the sound patterns in Chinese, uh, you have tones. Uh, in Japanese, you have different sounds. Uh, in Russia, you have uh, different sounds. Um, in African languages, you have different sounds. Uh, you have the clicks. You may know about this, um, the African click, click language. What is occurring, everybody? Welcome to Tosakaya. I am so sorry that this lesson took so long. Um, but anyway, it was worth it, I believe. I'm going to teach you how to say the clicks. For example, Tosa, my language that I speak, it is one of the three major clicks that we use. The three clicks are X, which is, you know, or the C, which is pronounced and the Q, which is pronounced T. You have in Arabic some of the throat sounds. Uh, like you, you might say somebody's name is Kahalit, Kahalit, K-H-A-L-I-D. In Arabic, it would be Khalit, Khalit. So there's a more of a throat sound in terms of expressing that word. Uh, and it's important if you're marketing and you have a campaign, you want to make sure you have that correct. Because, of course, if you do something different, then it may have a, a totally different connotation. And then when we talk about morphology and, and inflection, word inflection, of emphasizing something and making sure that that emphasis carries a deeper meaning. If you put emphasis on a word, you, you're trying to, to make sure that people pay attention to that word. And it says here, Russian is a highly inflected language with six different case endings for nouns and adjectives. Now, I do know that uh, with Russian names, you have this um, structure where someone's name is, say, uh, Kasparov, which was a former world chess champion. And his name, let's say if, if there was a female equivalent or someone in his family, she would be Kasparova. She would have an A at the end of her name because that represents that she is a woman. And, you know, there are some other there are other languages that will make a distinction between the genders based upon how the name is uh, is written. So it's very, um, very interesting. Here you have this idea of language and Chinese is, of course, very difficult because you have so many different 
the kanjis, the, the characters, the, um, well, actually in Japanese they're called the kanji, but in, in Chinese you have all of these, these uh, characters which um, mean very different things. And there was a, a very, very interesting case recently where uh, Arianda Grant had a tattoo on her, her hand but it was misspelled instead of meaning uh, one thing I believe it was um, eternal peace and or something like that and, and the way she had it spelled it meant um, some kind of uh, skillet some some kind of uh, grill uh, that she had on her wrist and so she corrected it but it was uh, uh, it was very it was an embarrassment to her because um, Obviously, she, she was not a native speaker, so she didn't uh, know the difference. But that's an example of how, how things can, can um, go wrong, uh, and companies make these errors all the time. Here you have some interesting uh, ideas in terms of football in Chinese. And even some of the characters may take on a visual uh, appeal. Uh, as you could even look at the, I don't know Chinese, but you could look at a Hail Mary pass. It looks like somebody uh, is trying to convey something to the end zone. Now, Chinese, I believe, is read from, uh, from right to left, uh, but it just kind of looks like something that's going on there that you can see uh, a relationship between the characters. Here again, pronunciation problems. And cell phones and cell phone texting. The, these are some things that we don't often deal with here uh, when you talk about uh, the combination of, of numbers and what they mean. Uh, here in Korea, or in Korea, you have a very specific uh, idea of how these, uh, the, the sequence of numbers uh, carry on certain meanings. So in terms of language and communication, English is spoken widely as a second language, but is not the most widely spoken language. Of course, we know Mandarin Chinese is the uh, in terms of numbers of people, it's the most widely spoken language. Um, but of course, English is very dominant in the business setting, uh, and there is even more of an emphasis for people to learn English in their schooling because it has so that kind of influence. Nonverbal communication in Middle East Westerners should not show the soles of shoes or pass documents with the left hand. In Japan, bowing has many nuances. Now, we may have the tendency, okay, I want to meet someone from Japan, and you go and you bow, but each level of your bow has a different meaning. So you want to make sure that if you're going to uh, participate in that, in that ritual that you know what level of respect to give to, to that other person that you're bowing to. So we talked a lot about McDonald's. And I won't say much more about McDonald's other than to say that this idea that McDonald's is a symbol of globalization. I think we very well understand that. Uh, and if you go to the McDonald's uh, corporate website, they'll have links to different different McDonald's in different countries and you will see the variation of the um, of the different McDonald's around the world but McDonald's has done very well in terms of trying to ensure that they keep a level of standardization but they also adapt to the local culture as well and they've done a very good job uh, at, a, at accomplishing that High and low context cultures, you have high context, which has this very, very explicit expression. 
low context implicit means that you have to have a little bit of nuance in the cultural context in order to understand what is going on in order to understand what certain things mean um, both spoken and unspoken you know, that makes a very big difference in terms of the way communication is uh, is conveyed and you have here high context Saudi Arabia and Japan uh, Chinese a lot of African cultures are high context because there are things that are subtle that you need to understand before you can gain the um, the um, the full context of what's being conveyed here's uh, another table in terms of high context versus low context of course we know we live in a litigious society so your word is very important what you say uh, is will be held to you even if you say it in social media so that's something that is uh, very uh, uh, distinctive when you talk about high versus low context uh, in, in terms of uh, culture and then Hofstede's cultural topology now this framework actually has six levels so if you look at your book on page 119 they talk about this uh, framework and on page 120 it is uh, illustrated and again they only give you five but there are actually six elements uh, six dimensions of national culture and the other one that is um, that should be added is the uh, indulgence versus restraint so you have a, uh, a sixth element which is again not in the book but the idea that in societies you have uh, those who prescribe to that culture tend to either indulge or restrain so in this society in the in, in the american society there's more indulgence because we want the big life we want you know luxuries we want to live uh, you know very comfortably but in other places it may be more of this idea of restraint and just having a life that meets the basic needs and not having so much that um, you know that that's going to be excess so you have all of these different uh, ideas of, of whether one should uh, restrain not only in terms of what you have but how you spend your money are you a saving culture do you save or do you spend so here we spend and in fact, we spend money we don't have through um, getting loans or using credit. And that's something that's very common here. And here are the dimensions. Uh, as I said, there are actually six dimensions. There's in, indulgence versus restraint that you also want to add. Self-reference criteria and the idea that you have a certain cultural reference that you're operating from when you travel to other countries and when you talk to people from different cultures and it's the only one you know frankly and so what you would try to do is when you communicate you would try to bridge the difference somehow based upon your knowledge but if you don't know it's going to be pretty um, uh, it's going to be common for miscommunication of mistakes um, to be made because there won't be the understanding of what you're trying to convey uh, for an example if you meet someone and in that culture they have the tendency to stand very close to you eight inches away and you're thinking that's a very close proximity so you might might instinctively move back to try to establish a safer distance or more comfortable distance and in doing that you may create some discomfort with the other person because they're thinking well why are you moving back but for you you have a different cultural context 
you know, that you're coming from, so you may not feel as uh, as comfortable. Or the idea that in some societies, and I mentioned this in some other classes, so when I was in Egypt for the first time, uh, or for my, my first trip overseas, I saw men holding hands and men arm in arm. And in this cultural context, that means something totally different. But in Egypt, it means that this is my friend. These are grown men. But this is someone who's my friend. This is someone I care about. And this is an outward way of showing it. Now, obviously here, if someone grabbed our hand, if, a, if another man grabbed your hand and started walking down the street with you, you would think, okay, there's something wrong here. Or he must have a certain sexual orientation. That's what we think. Uh, but of course, that person may be coming from a culture where that is common. Uh, there's another case. Uh, I remember of a, a, a classmate of mine telling me that he worked at a, a senior home. And there were some other guys from his country who were sitting around talking. And they were and they were just they would grab uh, a friend's hand and just hold it. And so the people in the complex thought that there was something else going on there and they stopped being friendly. And so my classmate asked, he said, well, you used to, people used to be so friendly, but now they don't seem to be speaking to us anymore like they were before. And then the person he was talking to told them that what they thought was the case and he said, oh, no, 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 this just means in my country that's how we communicate. It's just He's he's just my friend and it's just something that we do. And so then they, they understood, but still self reference criterion, you're looking at someone else based upon your own cultural values. So it is a uh, very very interesting if you're doing research overseas and you observing something, but then you have your own cultural context, you can very well make some uh, embarrassing mistakes. This idea of diffusion theory, meaning how quickly do you adopt something? And of course, culture plays a big role in your adoption process. And it also plays a role into what is actually being presented to you. What are you adopting? Makes a big difference. But in marketing, you learned about this, uh, this adoption process. The idea of awareness, going through this this uh, phase of becoming aware of something, and then going further and becoming interested, then evaluating it, whether it meets your value proposition. And then if you decide that it may meet your value proposition, you may try it and then decide whether or not you want to buy it. And it's interesting that many cultures have a different uh way of uh, adoption, different stages of adoption. And here, when you talk about adopting an innovation, innova innovation is something new. And when it's new, you're looking at the new product and you're comparing it to something that you're familiar with. Since it is new, you really, you have no direct basis of comparison, but then you can indirectly compare it with something else. And you can decide whether that has uh, a value. Some things are simply not appropriate. So there was a, I was at a conference and there was a, a speech that was um, being done at a luncheon and in, in this, this uh, professor was talking about having a meal in China with a, with a, a group of people that he was with. And they had ordered some meals and, you know, they were having a great time. And I think they had ordered a couple of bottles of champagne. And I don't know what kind of event it was, but they had ordered some champagne. And uh, all of a sudden they started hearing banging noise you know, in the back. You know, this loud banging noise. And they were wondering, what is that noise? And why is, why, why are they banging, you know, whatever they're banging? And so they bring the meals out and everything, and it just dawned on the people at the table that they were banging this champagne bottle to get it open. 
And sure enough, it was open and, you know, they had the glasses there and everything. And, and so one of the persons at the table said, well, why don't why don't you just use a, a bottle opener? You know, just cork and it just opens the cork. He says, well, why do we need that? We, we don't need that. We we'll just we just bang it and it opens. <laughs> it was like. It's interesting because it makes sense. It makes sense that, well, perhaps you don't need this this cork opener because you can just bang it in and it opens. Now, again, it's a cultural context because we're used to having, uh, you know, a champagne uh, opener, you know, bottle opener that, you know, it opens it very easily. But it just kind of shows you the mindsets are different in terms of innovations and the way people think of uh, think of these, um, think of, of, of what value proposition that they can get as opposed to the amount of money that they're spending for it. Here is the diffusion theory that you may have seen already. You have the um, the life cycle of products below, introduction, growth, maturity, decline that you've seen before in marketing. And then you have the adopted categories. See, the innovators are the first ones to get products, the first ones to try products. Then you have the early adopters who are not quite like innovators uh, who will stand in line waiting for hours for the new release of a uh, cell phone or, you know, the next pair of athletic uh, footwear. Uh, but these are just after that. They're on the cutting edge, but they're not quite on the bleeding edge. And they um, are right there in the 13 and a half percent. Then you get the early majority who may think, OK, I'm just waiting until all the kinks get out and and waiting to get feedback from what other others uh, may say about it. Then you have those from the late majority who says, OK, well, wait for the price to come down. And now I'm comfortable with getting this product. The learning curve is much lower. The bugs are out and I'm good. And then the laggards are those who simply say, well, hey, I just got to get on board because um, you know, this is something that is becoming, you know, increasingly uh, important for me to, to adopt uh, be, due, due to, co to the conveniences that it offers. And so you have this this idea of um, this this uh, cycle. Now, in other countries, this is slightly different, you know, depending on what country you go to in the culture, there may be a slightly different uh, cycle. And so you look at the Asian product life cycle, it is uh, uh, apparently very, very different. And so if you look at page uh, 126 and 127, they talk about this. The fusion of innovations in Pacific Rim countries based on a cross-cultural comparison of the United States, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. Takata and Jane presented evidence that different country characteristics in particular, culture and communication patterns affect diffusion processes for room air conditioners, washing machines, and calculators. Proceeding from the observation that Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan are high context cultures with relatively homogeneous populations, in the United States is a low context, heterogeneous culture. Takata and Jane surmised that Asia would show faster rates of diffusion than the United States. A second hypothesis supported by the research was that the adoption would proceed more quickly in markets where innovations were introduced relatively late. So there's a cross-cultural comparison between the US and Asian countries showing that this life cycle happens in different, um, uh, kind of in a different pace. Environmental sensitivity. We always talk about CSR corporate social responsibility and the idea that a, a company when going into another country has to be culturally sensitive to the environment uh, such that you know you could have some kind of uh, uh, some kind of balance in terms of what it is you're doing there uh, a lot of companies when they go into a country where the regulations aren't as, as stiff they may find that they um, 
they have issues with the, the local populace because there might be some pollution uh, in the water, there, there may be issues with waste, there may be issues with contamination, cross contamination, uh, all kinds of issues with air quality. And it is uh, certainly a very serious issue that companies are now addressing. And, but there are also companies that have been cited as a result of not adhering to some of those environmental uh, rules and regulations. And, and so that's certainly something that uh, a lot of companies are, are looking at when they go into foreign markets. Coca-Cola was actually cited in India because it was said that they were exhausting the water supply in a particular area where the plant was. Another case had to do with a pharmaceutical company dumping pharmaceutical drugs in the water supply and people were were gaining the side effects from actually taking from ingesting the uh, the chemicals of pharmaceuticals so had a lot of issues as it relates to uh, culture and the uh, being culturally sensitive and ensuring that that company is um, adhering to those, uh, you know, the, the guidelines that that uh, country has set forth. Even if that country has not mandated that that company abide by certain environmental regulations, that company has its own internal standards that it has to meet. And... You don't want to end up being like a Nike who was cited for uh, turning a blind eye to sweatshop conditions. And so you actually had a situation in Pakistan where you had children working in these sweatshops, sewing soccer balls together in athletic apparel until one of the uh, athletes went over and investigated and she saw these conditions and she went back into the Nike office and she demanded that something be done. And so that represented a kind of a, a um, um, this, this activism of ensuring that there is some sensitivity in terms of the, in the environment. So that's going to do it for the review. I know it was a, a bit longer than I had planned. It was about 40 minutes, 40 to 50 minutes. There were a couple of breaks in there, and hopefully that was of some use. So on Tuesday, I will close out this um, chapter and maybe share some of these uh, points again in class and get your feedback. And then we're going to prepare for our case um, that will be due on the 21st, I believe it is. And then we will uh, also prepare for our, our group projects and look forward to seeing what we can do this semester. All right. So I'll see you all on Tuesday and make sure that you're there on time. And um, hopefully you're having a good weekend and I'll see you on Tuesday. Bye bye. Kuni.